All right, so I just wanted to say thanks uh, to Sophia and Dan for inviting me to come and talk uh, today about the sustainable farming practices at uh, Grow Johnson County. Um, so, yeah, um, a little bit about uh, myself. My name's Lisa Stark. I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Iowa Valley Resource Conservation and Development. Uh, we're a, a nonprofit that's based in Amana, Iowa, and our team works to strengthen food systems across the state. Um, and as part of that work, the Iowa Valley RCD manages a hunger relief farm. Um, which is also an educational farm uh, based out of Iowa City, and it is called Grow Johnson County. Um, so, yeah, at Grow, we work to provide uh, food access for Johnson County's most vulnerable residents, as well as equip and educate aspiring growers with land-based food production experience. Uh, Grow operates a six-acre organic farm and we are located at the Johnson County Historic Poor Farm. Uh, you can see uh, this picture here. We've got a couple big um, barns, the stock barn, um, and then right next to the cultivation station is um, an old dairy barn. Um, so all of our food uh, that we grow at our six acre farm is donated to social service agencies across Johnson County. Um, and at GROW, we believe that uh, diversity brings strength, creativity, and resilience. Um, and we believe it's one of our key roles in uh, creating meaningful opportunities for Black, Indigenous, people of color to engage in the food, sits in, engage in the food system. Uh, and we seek to empower marginalized people uh, to become future leaders in a just, equitable food system. So, yeah, a little bit of history about Grow Johnson County. So, our farm started in 20, well, actually, <laughs> let me back up. Uh, in 2014, the Johnson County Board of Supervisors called for a proposal for an agriculture project at the uh, historic poor farm. And uh, from that call for proposals, my executive director, Jason Grimm, and uh, the executive director at the Coralville Food Pantry, John Bowler, and um, another uh, garden guru in the community, Scotty Kepke, uh, they got together and kind of brainstormed this idea to uh, grow food and donate it to hunger relief organizations throughout the county. And um, they wanted to create opportunities for people to learn about uh, growing food and so the, the County Board of Supervisors loved the idea, and in 2015, uh, GROW was established, and they planted two acres of cover crops. Uh, organic farming is a process. It takes time to rebuild soil health, um, and just build soil health in general. So, uh, you know, they set out to plant cover crops, and in 2016, that was the first year that two acres of um, vegetables were grown and 11,000 pounds of produce was distributed across the county. Uh, in 2017, they expanded to four acres. Um, and 2019, they built a greenhouse. Um, originally, they were growing plant starts in Cedar Rapids at Kirkwood Community College in their greenhouse and having to commute back and forth um, and pack up vehicles full of transplants to plant out of the farm. Uh, so in 2019, uh, they received a, a grant from the Wellmark Foundation in order to build this greenhouse. Um, and you can see this photograph here is uh, an apprentice, uh, Aluna, from last season. Um, she's in the greenhouse harvesting basil. Um, and that's one of the unique things about um, the farm in our educational outreach. We have uh, an apprenticeship program and, you know, we really try to allow the apprentices to focus on what they're interested in. And Aluna really took to, um, you know, greenhouse production. So um, since the greenhouse has, um, you know, really allowed to grow 
uh, really allowed Grow to expand. And uh, in 2020, uh, we were growing on five acres and utilizing that greenhouse space to extend the, the harvest uh, season and growing season. Um, and it's another, uh, the infrastructure allows us to cure onions and winter squash in, in the space because it heats up and um, is a good place to, uh, yeah, cure those, those vegetables. Um, so, all right. Um, now I wanna tell you a little bit about where the Grow Johnson County Farm is located. It's um, on uh, uh, a historic poor farm. Um, it, do any of you, are you, are you guys familiar with what a poor farm is? Have you ever heard of the concept? Um, well, I hadn't heard uh, about it until this uh, call for a proposal at the historic poor farm. Um, was established, and so I, in based on my research, um, I found out you know across the United States in the 1820s, um, it became state and local governments' duty to care for impoverished people with mental illnesses. And in 1855, the county, um, the Johnson County Board of Supervisors at that time, allocated 160 acres. Um, of land at the edge of Iowa City for a poor farm. Um, and this was um, early care for impoverished and mentally ill folks, which was kind of considered crude by today's standards. Uh, this photograph here is actually one of the historic buildings out at the farm. It was referred to as an asylum, and we still call it that today. Um, the first two years that this poor farm was um, in, in process and people were living there, folks lived in those cells. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a really unique site. There's a cemetery on site where uh, people were buried um, that lived on site. Uh, there's really fertile farmland. There's uh, a pollinator meadow and or a reconstructed prairie, um, soon to be wetland. Um, and there's a woodland and timber as well. So, um, yeah, so residents that lived out here were expected to complete farm chores to the extent of their physical ability, and crop farming and dairy production were the primary functions of uh, the Johnson County poor farm until the 1960s. Um, so I just wanted to touch on some other programs that are um, at the historic poor farm. And I just think it's really unique that the county like wanted to really like reclaim this space and utilize it as um, uh, it, like an opportunity for residents to engage with local foods and the local food system. Um, yeah, so other programs that we have going on at the farm, there's not just the Grow Johnson County six acre farm. We've got the Global Food Project, which is uh, an initiative of IC Compassion. That's one of our partner organizations that we send food to, but they also, um, they're an organization that connects new residents to Johnson County. So immigrants and refugees, uh, they connect those folks to garden plots out at the farm. Um, and it sounds like this season they're gonna have 40 uh, families gardening uh, from all different countries. And it's, it's really unique and cool to, to walk through some of those gardens because those folks that are there are utilizing practices from their home countries. So it's an opportunity for you know, people who live in Iowa that are used to um, you know, a very particular type of technique when it comes to gardening and farming to um, kind of skill share, learn new things from, from other people. Um, we also have a land access program, which provides um, low rent uh, for beginning farmers. Uh, we have five um, market gardeners, or I should say farmers. So I come from a, a gardening background. <laughs> so it, yeah, the two worlds really uh, kind of meet for me. But 
Uh, the land access program is for uh, beginning farmers who are ready to scale up their operations and want access to affordable farmland. So we've got five uh, different farms um, out there. This is a picture of one of those farmers. His name's Alfred. He's from the Dominican Republic of the Congo, and he, um, he grows uh, onions and hot peppers, and he actually makes a value-added product with all those uh, vegetables that he grows and makes this incredible hot sauce. Um, we've got, so in the future, um, the, the unique thing about the historic poor farm is that it's, it's really a malleable, sort of changing, um, dynamic situation, and we are slowly kind of developing infrastructure, and um, we want to build wellness trails out there uh, so people can come and kind of reconnect with nature, uh, develop a relationship with the land. Um, we hope to uh, build a commercial kitchen out there um, for you know, folks that are farming out there. They can use the commercial kitchen to then make their value-added products, but then we can utilize that as um, an educational space, teach people um, uh, you know, how to cook, um, have cooking classes, food preservation classes, and um, eventually, um, when there are events out at the farm, we'll be able to use that uh, commercial kitchen space. And so we've got a woodland restoration that's happening right now. Um, and then we off also offer events and tours. Um, so now back to Grow Johnson County. Um, a little bit about our on-farm conservation at GROW. This is what I'm really excited about. I also have a, a background in land restoration, and I think it's really important to reconnect food systems with ecosystems. And some ways that we're doing that at GROW is um, we've got three beetle banks for habitat for predatory ground beetles. Uh, which is <laughs> a way for us to call in the good insects to predate and eat the pest insects that um, you know eat our potatoes, uh, <laughs> our potato plants. Uh, we have a 15-acre prairie reconstruction, um, which uh, is about to have its first prescribed burn, which is a really good maintenance tool to uh, increase the health and diversity of that prairie system. Uh, we interplant with flowers in our crop fields as well. Um, what, so this picture on the, the far right is a picture of a, I don't know if you guys can tell, but it's a tomato hornworm. It's a big green worm that eats tomato and pepper plants. And those little white, um, like sacks on it are actually, uh, a cocoon of a predatory wasp. So this wasp, this tiny little wasp comes in and, um, lays its eggs on the caterpillar, and the, <laughs> the eggs hatch, they eat the inside of the caterpillar, and then they pupate on the outside of the body. And it's a really cool process. Like, I was so excited to find that in the field. And um, it's important to plant additional flowers to call in those uh, pollinators and other uh, beneficial insects, including predatory wasps. Spiders are also great uh, predators. So uh, yeah, we like to plant different flowers of varying heights because it makes really good habitat for spiders to build their nests or their webs and catch um, insects. So yeah, um, we are, um, as these beetle banks, if I can talk more about those, uh, <laughs> this, this stuff like really, um, is what I'm excited about at the farm. Uh, these strips of habitat are, we plant them directly adjacent to our crop fields. Um, and so they're also a critical refuge for, um, you know, uh, to decrease soil disturbance and they really promote the movement of pollinators and predators into our crop fields. Um, so the beetle banks are primarily composed of native grasses, like bunch grasses, including like Cytone scramma, uh, 
prairie june grass and little blue stem. And um, I think these are, yeah, really important strategies for um, a, a diversified vegetable operation because it's, it's an intensive growing system and you're kind of, it's dy dynamic, you're kind of moving in and out. So having um, uh, habitat that's in place and um, uh, yeah, gonna be there for a while is, is important. Um, some of the days, or some of the ways we reduce erosion is by keeping our soil covered. Um, 90% of our crop fields are planted to cover crops, and I'll talk a little bit more about the benefits of those uh, here in the next slide. And we also um, use city leaf mulch in the fall as a way to cover our garlic specifically and other, um, other farm fields um, because all of that leafy um, Litter breaks down and adds organic matter to the soil. We also have stable grass pathways. Um, you know, we do have farm equipment, tractors, um, and an ATV, and so we want to make sure that uh, we're not driving on our fields and compacting that soil. So we have these stable pathways that we try to stick to. Um, so, what is organic vegetable production? What does that mean? Um, Organic farming is, is anything but industrial. It's biological. Um, it's dealing with a vital living system. And the major workers are the soil microorganisms, the fungi, the mineral particles, the sun, the air, the water. Um, they're all parts of this system. And when you're an organic farmer, it's kind of a matter of like coordinating the whole, and that's what leads to success. Um, so, we eliminate negative things um, of the industrial system, such as a two crop rotation. Um, our crop rotations look a lot um, bigger than that, you know, um, and we don't grow just two crops. And so, um, yeah, we eliminate things like soil erosion, fertilizer runoff, and pesticide pollution. Um, and some of the ways we're doing this is through the integrated pest management. And that prioritizes the ecological principles first, which are our prairie reconstruction, our beetle banks, um, our crop rotation and cultural control, um, which looks like, like literally walking through a potato field and pulling off those Colorado potato beetles and like smashing them. Uh, and that's a way for us to minimize um, uh, using Pesticides in an organic system, you can use uh, pesticides when needed. Um, and those are derived from, in an organic system, those pesticides are derived from uh, natural um, components. And um, so we don't use any petroleum-based chemicals on our fields um, and no synthetic fertilizers, which really are, um, you know, chemicals and things that, that last a long time and they don't go away quickly like the organic pesticides that we're using. Those things can, um, you know, take years to break down and still be present in the soil. Um, so uh, one of the ways uh, we really hone in on this organic production is through our crop rotation. Um, and that just means we're using a variety of crops, um, which creates stability um, in biological systems. And crop rotation is a practice of changing the crop from year to year on the same piece of ground. Um, different crops, and these crops are not related botanically because uh, two successive crops do not make the same demands on the soil for nutrients. Um, and nor do they share diseases or insect pests. So they provide um, better plant nutrition, soil structure, and then yields, which is, you know, beneficial for the whole, you know. Um, and let's see, another way we manage weeds on the farm without chemicals is through tillage. Um, we do use plastic mulch in some of our fields, particularly uh, where we have our tomatoes, our tomatillos, and our peppers planted. Um, and that's just a, a good method because it heats up the soil quickly and um, 
then we're able to increase yields of, of those crops. Um, so another way that we really hone in on organic production is through cover crops, which suppress weeds and provide additional nutrients to reinvigorate the soil, um, which also provides uh, soil health improvements, slows the velocity of water uh, from rain or snow melt, and reduces soil loss, which is super important. Um, over time, crops, uh, cover crops increase the soil organic matter, um, and that leads to improving soil structure, stability, and increases like pore space for root development. So those plant roots are able to draw um, like different nutrients out of the soil. So then the, the food is more nutrient dense in the long run. Um, so one of the ways that we connect with our uh, community partner organizations is through evaluation. And in the past, uh, we focused on primarily the agency staff members to, to get feedback about uh, you know, the, the people that were utilizing those services and how to meet people's needs. Um, and in 2020, January of 2020, um, we piloted uh, this voice or choice survey. Um, this was something I got to work on this winter. Um, and yeah, in that first year, we received 165 total responses from the survey. Um, and um, that was really good feedback for us because this survey actually um, helps us tailor our crop plan for the year. Like we want to know what vegetables people want to eat. It's really important for us uh, at GROW. We really believe in a concept of food sovereignty, which is the right uh, to people having access to healthy food that's culturally relevant to them. And so, you know, rather than going to a food pantry and talking to the staff members there about what their clients like, uh, we want to get that feedback directly from those people. So um, we developed this Voice or Choice survey, which is a really um, accessible, simple, um, image-based survey that's available in six languages um, so that everybody has um, an opportunity to provide feedback. And um, this year, we were able to get 246 responses thus far. Um, and it told us, you know, people really want watermelon, they want carrots, they want onions, bell peppers, broccoli. Um, these responses, like, we were looking at results when we were crop planning this year to determine what varieties to grow. And um, in addition to, you know, these heavy hitters like watermelon and carrots, everybody likes that stuff. Um, we're actually going to be growing sweet potatoes this year for the first time. We're going to grow amaranth, um, which is a, a nutritious uh, green. And um, we're going to grow garlic chives and perilla and paste tomatoes. And that's all based on results of this Voice for Choice survey. Um, so here are some of the organizations that we partner with. Um, so grateful to uh, Table to Table. They're our distribution partner. They come to our farm three days a week and pick up food to deliver to um, all these other organizations, which include food pantries, um, HACAP, uh, like preschool Head Start programs. They do meal prep there for young kids, um, the domestic violence intervention program. Um, yeah, we're, you know, trying to build that out as well. Like we, we want to bring on more people to partner with, more organizations that, um, you know, want to provide healthy, nutrient-dense food uh, to people. So um, I brought some copies of our annual report. This is just kind of uh, 2021 by the numbers. Um, feel free to grab one before you guys take off today if you're interested. Uh, we've got a couple articles in there, one from our executive director. Um, and this is just a way for us to kind of shout like the good work that's happening out at the farm. Uh, this last year, 2021, we grew 51 varieties of vegetables. Uh, we harvested 5,460 pounds of watermelon. Like, you know, this is stuff we're celebrating. So I wanted to throw that up there for you guys to see it. Um, 
So uh, we are so thrilled to have as many uh, high quality volunteers out at the farm. I like to think of them as the stewards of the farm. Um, I'm new to grow. I started in September of 2021 and the volunteers were like training me on <laughs> certain practices. And we have some volunteers that have been involved, you know, since the beginning, uh, really. And I think grow is a great way for people to get outside, have fresh air, exercise, enjoy the natural beauty of the farm. Um, and it feels like family out there. Um, you know, we really encourage uh, people to uh, come and hang out with us and plant food, harvest food. Um, you know, volunteers help with everything from seeding in the greenhouse, which we started in uh, February 22nd. We were out there um, in the cold, protected from <laughs> the wind and uh, Cold, cold air in our greenhouse seeding onions and you know people showed up and it's it's really great um, because of COVID uh, we kind of adapted how we do recruitment for volunteers um, we figured out that like it works really well for people to come out Monday, Monday Wednesday Friday from eight to noon we want people to commit to coming out you know 10 to 15 hours a month if you can but if that's not possible that's okay too. Um, we just want people to have, um, you know, opportunities and whatever that looks like for your, your schedules, uh, we can adapt to that. So, um, yeah, I think another critical thing to highlight here is um, we do a lot of knowledge sharing with our volunteers. Um, and there's a lot of educational opportunities, um, you know, not only for the volunteers, but for, this, for the staff too. Um, so uh, one last thing I wanted to touch on is our 2022 apprenticeship. Um, we are currently taking applications um, for a summer position that starts in mid-May and runs through September. Um, application close on, close on the 1st of April. Uh, we're, we're hoping, you know, to have people come on the farm and work 20 hours a week um, and really learn and work on the farm, learn about organic vegetable production, uh, land-based education, volunteer coordination. You know, we're a nonprofit organization, so it's definitely, you know, stepping into that world as well. Um, we do on-farm record keeping, so if you're really data-driven, you know, there's opportunities there uh, to get involved. Um, if you're really interested in policy work, um, <laughs> my program director is involved in the Local Foods Coalition, and, um, you know, I, I feel like there's a, a lot of really good opportunities for people to get involved. So, um, Again, there's some information on the table about the apprenticeship. If you guys are interested, um, we'd be happy to have you. So um, yeah, this is our website. Check out our Facebook. We're pretty active on social media. Um, Julia, our creative coordinator, has, has gotten us into doing reels. So that's a thing now that's <laughs> happening at the farm. So yeah, check out our Instagram too. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. I'm just going to put in here that as part of the adult summer reading program this summer, we're taking a tour out there because it's so cool and there's so much stuff to see and do and learn about. I'm really excited about the, the little, not little, the garden plots that you're giving to new immigrants yeah. and to see all the different crops, not mm -hmm. just the guy that makes peppers, but you know, people are growing food that is native to their own countries in Iowa City. I mean, that, that floors me that, you know, here in Iowa, people are growing stuff from the Belgian Congo and all sorts of places. So, yeah, they are open to tours. So, <laughs> yeah, happy to have you guys come out for a tour. Um, we're hoping to have a lot of on-farm events this summer, including... Um, you know, potlucks and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, 
other events as well, field days, workshops. Um, so check out our social media, check out our website. It'll all be on there. So yeah, guys. <laughs> Oh, another thing I forgot to mention, lots of fresh produce. Uh, if you come out and volunteer, we have a friends and family bin, so we like to feed people. So. <laughs> okay, I'll start with this. Uh, so we wanted to give thanks for everyone to showing up, first of all. Uh, second of all, we wanted to give thanks to the Iowa um, City Public Library and um, Lisa for having us and just letting us have this event. So, you know, like the logo you see at the bottom, we're running this event through the school, actually. So it's a science outreach program. So if you sign up for the class, it's a two semester class. Uh, and we're basically having a science communication project. And we decided to just do sustainable practices as a group project. So if you guys were interested in that, that's a really cool class um, you guys can take. And we're going to talk about native Iowa flowers, uh, which you guys can take if you want. There's seeds in that table uh, that you can just plant in their native Iowa flowers, which is pretty cool. And we're going to dive into like some of them um, into a little bit. So my name is Sophia. This is Daniel. We're from um, Latham. And we're going to talk about the seed packets, first of all. Uh, so we got them from High Country Gardens. Um, and those are all the species that are in there, which is plenty. Uh, <laughs> And we're gonna talk about the ones that are um, bolded, but as well the ones that are with the little star and asterisk, those are native to Iowa specifically, which is a really cool fact um, because you can now, after this hopefully, walk outside and see a bunch of flowers and be like, oh, I know that flower. Um, so yeah, we're gonna dive into like why they're important and the different species that we thought were kind of cool to talk about. So we have why are native flowers important? So. Um, I mean, they're native, first of all. <laughs> they're literally adapted to be here with the soil, the humidity, the water, pretty much everything. Uh, they require a lot less active care. What, I, what we researched basically was that during the first year you have to water it, but after that you pretty much let them to be and they will just keep growing for the rest of their lives. Um, they are also important for preventing unnecessary runoff from like farming and other stuff. So just Kind of like how plant, um, some trees do it in, in some other ecosystems, but in Iowa they have a lot of prairie uh, that is very important with their flowers. Um, they're very complex Iowa um, ecosystems. The more we dove into like researching all of this, we research, we realized that it was like a lot. <laughs> There's so many different plant species, and a lot of species are very peculiar to which flowers they pick. Um, and we'll dive into that as well. But like some butterflies or some insects only pick one flower. So like the conservation of them is really important because you know like we're gonna talk about the monarch butterflies, like they only go to one specific plant. So it's like really important. Um, and if you guys know the greenhouse at the, at the university, the guy up there, Ray, he's like super passionate about all of this. So if you guys are interested in this, go talk to him. He's like a huge nerd of this basically. Um, they also help the soil prevent erosion and improve water quality. So they're pretty much really important. Um, they also, I wanted to highlight because we're gonna go over like how important they are for indigenous people. At times they have like, there's practices with the flowers for different uses. So not only are they important for the ecosystem, but they're also culturally important for the people to hear. Okay, yeah. So one of the flowers that are, uh, is found in our kits is the blazing stars, the prairie blazing star, I guess. Um, so there are host plants for some species of noctoid flower moths. So these are, like as Sophia mentioned, those moths that specifically target this flower as a pollinating source. Um, and they're named this way because caterpillars eat the flower buds and develop seeds of the host plants through this mechanism. The females deposit eggs onto the host plants. Um, they're also characteristic of Midwestern prairie, uh, Midwestern prairies, and they grow up to two to feet, two to five feet tall. Um, they're also very easy to grow. Uh, our next flower here is the lemon mint, which is um, which blooms annually during the winter. The leaves are very distinctive due to their very citrusy smell. So that's a 
additional bonus to whatever garden you want to add it to. And um, it can also be added to salads and drinks for that uh, citrusy flavor. Um, so both of these plants are native to Iowa, so that's an additional bonus. The red columbine is known for its shape and color. It's also known to attract hummingbirds, which is always a bonus. Um, it's reported that indigenous populations rub the crushed seeds on the hands of men as a love charm. Interesting fact. And this flower blooms from March to July and is highly tolerant of droughts. The butterfly weed is a beautiful orange flower that grows in full sun to around 30 inches tall. It blooms from June to August and is very drought resistant. Um, it's also resistant to um, pests along with rabbits and deer, so you won't have to worry about any of that, I guess. Uh, removal of the, so the seed pods prior to opening will prevent um, the seeds from self-sowing. Just interesting, nifty tidbit <laughs> about this plant. And um, these flowers are actually a food source for many butterflies, which can be used to attract many butterflies to whatever garden or whatever patch of land you want to add this to. Purple cone flowers are part of the daisy family and are found on the prairie or in dry grasslands. The cone portion of the flower is around 1.5 inches across, and its petals are around 4 inches. Um, this species was used by indigenous people to ease the symptoms of medical problems, ranging from snake bites, coughs, sore throats, headaches. And even to this day, it's marketed as a cold relief medicine, even though it's technically not, uh, there's no scientific evidence for it. Um, the false sunflower is a perennial plant that is a member of the aster family. Um, it's somewhat bushy, but it grows up to three to five feet tall and has a flower head that has um, eight to 20 florets. Um, birds, in particular game birds, songbirds, and um, some rodents have been known to eat the seeds of the false sunflower. Um, so these are our references during our research yeah. <laughs> to create this presentation. And once again, we wanted to thank uh, the Iowa City Public Library and Grow Johnson County for helping us with this event. And also thank you to you guys for showing yeah. up.